Okay, go. Cool. Go ahead. <clears throat> hey guys, uh, welcome to the non dualism uh, uh, sec uh, section of uh, this Asian philosophies. Uh, um, hope you guys are enjoying uh, the Hinduism part of it, um, as you are enjoying Chinese part of it and other uh, South Asian things as well. Um, so this is great. Uh, thanks, Jason, for setting these things up. Um, so I guess we covered a bunch of things uh, over whatever three, four different sessions that we have done on Hinduism, right? Um, uh, what I want to do is I just want to take a very little segue into some really foundational things. And uh, they are sort of a bit counterintuitive. Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe we, can, we can talk about that and that will make uh, the, um, the, uh, the part of the lecture a little more uh, interesting, I guess. Um, uh, and and I'm, I'm actually not as uh, prepared with like fancy diagrams and stuff like that this time. <laughs> uh, so, You'll have to bear with me. Actually, some of these slides I have prepared, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so all right. So one one of the things that drove uh, Vedanta, uh, or how I see it, right? Again, I am very ignorant to this, and I'm coming at it from a very uh, fresh mind. I do have a Hinduism background. Um, but uh, uh, this uh, was uh, quite an eye-opening eye experience for me uh, when I came across this uh, over a couple of years. Um, and um, I, I wish uh, my parents and uh, family uh, would have taught uh, me, uh, taught us about this. And I think everybody should know about this. It has nothing to do with Hinduism, frankly. Um, so uh, what, they have, the, what the, the folks back then were doing was they were looking at human experience or what drives us in terms of fractals. So um, I hope uh, some of you understand what fractals is. Uh, fractals basically is you look at a structure at a very small scale and that same structure you will see at a larger scale. And uh, it is used heavily in engineering, right? And they, uh, today software engineering is uh, buzz, buzzed with this, you know, uh, um, a lot of the software recreation of uh, scene scenery and graphics or computer generated graphics and movies and things like that, they use fractals a lot. So what, uh, what Vedanta does is it takes the smallest experience, a human experience, waking up, sleeping, uh, you know, uh, just all of our stuff and it extrapolates that and it comes up with a theory of how to explain that what we cannot explain. Um, so observing individual experience, you know, uh, so there is uh, this concept called as man, uh, man basically means mind, um, and uh, we we know that this mind is what uh, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, all the time makes us feel sentient and conscious, right? So we associate with man uh, the consciousness, um, and and here they were looking at okay, well, how do I feel today, right? You know, and then they said they expand that to the universe, uh, and the universe is called as Brahman, right? the same similar experience uh, if it was taken at a cosmic sp a scope uh, from one individual to a cosmic uh, scope, right? That is, um, they come up with a term called as Brahman. Uh, it's just a term um, uh, for us, uh, it, it could mean just consciousness. It's just a different language, right? Um, has nothing to do with God whatsoever, uh, by the way. Uh, so we will talk about what God means in terms of Vedanta. It does have some connection to Hinduism, but it is very peripheral. Um, uh, so, and then there is another thing that they very, very closely started observing, which is what happens when we fall asleep? Uh, there is the dream part of it, there's the deep sleep part of it, right? They take that and again, make theories or conjectures about what might be happening at a cosmic level, the universe coming and going, right? Uh, universe being born and uh, uh, dying, destruction. Um, <clears throat> so what happens when you wake up, uh, right? So that, that um, and, and ultimately, you know, a lot, lot of their, the discussion, a lot of their philosophy, really, some of it might sound a little um, uh, far reaching uh, and uh, not believable. Um, but ultimately, if you really boil it down to our day-to-day -day 
understanding of how to deal with other people, really what it is trying to address is what is suffering, you know, how to overcome it, how to deal with other um, person on this planet, right? Um, that's, that's again, my understanding, right? Uh, and uh, hopefully you all uh, have your own uh, understanding around this stuff as well. Um, yeah, so, so this, this in nutshell is, you know, what they do is they look at me, myself, in the universe, right? So, uh, so the 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 um, um, so there are these two terms that uh, you might hear quite often, uh, which is atma um, and or atman, uh, right? Um, so and uh, Brahman, you know, we talked about that. Um, so Brahman is everywhere, right? So that's the one self, a unity self that is at a cosmic scope, and at my scope me, there is a self as well. And the idea is that this Atman and Brahman are the same self, right? But we kind of feel like individuals. So how do we explain that? Um, there was a very interesting article that I sent to you guys, uh, which uh, I, uh, I ran across and I, I kind of was like, uh, hey, you know, this name ATMA kind of seems very close to ATOM. Adam, uh, which is what uh, the Western uh, philosophers, you know, basically they, they dissected every aspect of things to that smaller, smallest uh, unit that they could go. Obviously, now we have gone past Adam, but Adam does retain that meaning of the smallest uh, unit, uh, right? That you you cannot break down further. Now, obviously, uh, there are particles, right? But but if we really stick to that uh, uh, that uh, term. Um, I think that little article that I sent you guys uh, kind of does a, a really uh, good description of uh, what I was thinking as well. Um, and then there is also, um, you know, if you think about it, um, the, we, if you look at us, right, we have our physical body that we can touch, but then there is also this vivacity, you know, we have life, we have a certain thing about us, um, which, you know, think of it as the energy. Um, and uh, there is the, there is also the mind, right? You know, we are, we are making up stories, we are looking at things, interpreting, judging, uh, lying, whatever, you know, <laughs> all kinds of things. Um, and then there is the intellect. Uh, so what they say in uh, Vedanta is that we are made of five layers. Uh, there are these five layers. Um, and uh, um, at the core of it, what shines all of these five layers is a, a self. Hey, Jason, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I have a, a small question on the, you talk about atom, right? In, in atom, that means uncuttable. Does a, a, a Sanskrit atom have the meaning of Uncuttable, this kind of meaning? Correct, correct. Yeah, that's that's literally, yeah. It is indivisible right there. Uh, it, it's the Greek uh, terms atomos. And um, how about in Sanskrit? Also has the same meaning as in it, 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 it effectively is, and we shall talk about that, right? So here uh, in this diagram that I was telling you, you know, you, you can break up the physical parts, you know, objects, physical parts, energy that we feel, the mental stuff, you know, uh, or wisdom. These are all, they come and go, they are divisible. They are, but when you come to the core, you know, uh, the, the, the proposition here is that that is uh, unknowable, yet it is knowable. We know, uh, we know that we are sentient and it is, you cannot break it further down. There is nothing to break it <laughs> because to break it further down, you will have to have consciousness to know that. So you, how can you know consciousness with consciousness? So there is nothing to break it down further. Uh, so in that sense, yes, they are they are indivisible. Yep. So atom is elemental, unitary, unchangeable, whole, irreducible. And you know, if you do further studies on Vedanta and uh, non-dualism and what they mean by Brahman or Atman, that's really what it boils down to. Uh, is uh, um, so, you know, so again, uh, there are, there are the, they come at this from multiple angles. You know, they, they, there is a whole uh, series of uh, shlokas or verses 
that talk about these five uh, layers uh, of five different kinds of bodies that we are embodied with. Um, and then there is this other one that we saw, right? Seer and seen, uh, where uh, there, is, there are objects, there are senses, there is the mind, and then there is consciousness that kind of shines through all of that. And that's why we feel sentient all the way through the tip of our fingers, right? Um, so uh, Atma, in that sense, right, Atman, or, you know, my own consciousness, um, it, is, it can also be uh, considered as everything is a projection of mind. <laughs> uh, so here, what it means is, you know, as I'm looking through um, the, the reflection of the, these, uh, this uh, computer uh, is telling me that it is a computer. And, uh, you know, there are people who are listening to me. Um, so, and so a lot of this is also a projection of my own mind uh, as well, right? So that is one way to think about it. Um, and what is anatman? So there is actually a word in Sanskrit, uh, anatman. Anatman means uh, anything that you think is not a consciousness, right? So we have confused, we saw this in Seer and Seen um, uh, discussion where mind takes over and it forgets that there is awareness, it itself thinks that it is aware. And that confusion, that, that superimposition basically causes all kinds of issues uh, for the human condition. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, when we think that I am the body and I'm the mind, um, that is um, whatever that projection is, uh, is the reality. So, uh, you know, uh, something is happening, uh, you know, you, we get dragged towards it or drag, get dragged away from it, right? Uh, attraction or fear. Uh, and then, you know, that, that results into so many things, right? You know, we, we feel like I want this and, you know, we go do some action to get it and that action could result to many other actions. So they, that is what uh, uh, in Vedanta, they call it as a circle of karma. So you create actions and that lead to actions that lead to actions and that lead to actions. So our birth effectively is a result of some past action. So we are here on this planet because we have this collection of karmas. <laughs> and so one of the things, one of the warnings actually uh, in Vedanta is that watch out, right? You are here, this is suffering. This is there because of your past karmas. Do not add to those karmas. You wanna get out of this cycle of karmas. Uh, so it is very counterintuitive that, hey, you know, life is so precious, we love life. We wouldn't want to extend our life. Uh, Vedanta goes, no, that is not going to do anything to you. You know, it's extending life is you're going to ex extend your misery. Um, and, you know, we, we want to be reborn. Uh, well, Vedanta says contrary. You know, you don't want to be reborn. Uh, you want to get to a state where they call that as the final liberation. And that liberation involves not getting this, uh, getting back into this body-mind uh, structure. And there, there is a phrase, there is a, shloka that talks about that uh yeah uh dlj oh hi yeah um cool the arrows joining consciousness to mind to senses to objects is that your insert there or are you telling us that that's the direction something goes in oh like uh yeah it, well yes it is uh, it is uh, intentional uh so the uh, con uh, the consciousness illuminates mind illuminates senses, illuminates the objects. So uh, objects see, exist because of consciousness. Objects don't, don't exist as per Vedanta. Okay. Yeah. So you can kind of see where they got it wrong there, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they... <laughs> nice idea, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there, there is also a, a concept of param atma. You will hear that. Um, Paramatma is that ultimate atom. <laughs> so this whole, this cosmic skull, you can think of it as that unitary principle, which cannot be divided further. That is that Brahman. And guess what? Uh, just like every individual, everything that we see here or in our dreams, you know, dream is a good example. So they take it from the dream and they say in, in the dream, everybody is our, our own projection. 
so are we, you know, we are the projection of Brahman or everything, every object, everything on the planet is projection of that. So it, as you can see, it's, it's a theory that they build based on now what we would call in Western science as uh, fractals. Uh, so it is looking at my experience and assuming or coming up with a theory that, okay, this is how I can explain the unknown. Um, so uh, hey, you have, we have a lot of hands up. Okay, sure, so you, sure. Okay. You want to answer the question now or you want to wait? That's fine. Okay, we can, we can go into questions, yeah. Go ahead. I guess I'm first. Um, I'll, uh, the, I was just wondering if um, this, this idea of the uh, cycle of karma is kind of uh, uh, self-defeating. In other words, uh, if you think that continuation of uh, Atman is a, uh, is a negative project and that uh, uh, the addition of karma is always a bad thing, then doesn't that kind of like doom isn't that a self-defeating prophecy, as they call it? The idea that you're just basically seeing civilization as a doomed concept and uh, uh, life as uh, uh, kind um, of uh, defective, inherently defective. Thank you. Uh, yeah, life is in life is inherently suffering. Uh, so that is the same concept that Buddha explores in Buddhism, uh, and Hinduism uh, fundamentally believes that, right? Um, so life is suffering. So what do you do with that, right? Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is not, uh, I don't think it is self-defeating. Uh, it is more of a way of, okay, it is suffering. How do we deal with it? How do we coexist rather than get depressed and run away from it? And what does it mean? You know, the, the fact that we want to live longer, it says something about our uh, desires uh, inner attachment to some physical object, uh, you know, and that that while that might be possible, that might not be possible, right? So how can you ready yourself? Um, in every action, if you see uh, how we are afraid, how we are angry, if you really, really, really boil it down, take it really deeper, we ultimately are, ultimately are afraid of death, you know? So how do you explain this? How do you explain that I was born in a certain situation, uh, you know, and all of that, right? So you can either point fingers out, outward or uh, take it upon yourself to, um, to internalize it and uh, use it to learn and build experiences that are going to help you to deal with life in a positive way. So karma, what karma means is that um, so I think, I think the notion of karma, uh, let, let's just uh, understand that for a bit. Um, so, so I'm living my life and th th this is common for all of us, I would say, uh, you know, uh, unless you are some reached uh, human, uh, like uh, Buddha, <laughs> um, is if we look at something, you know, we say, Hey, you know, my, my salary is pretty less or, Oh, you know, I need raise or I need a car. I need yet another car. I need this, or I need that. Oh, I, or I'm love with this person. I, I, I cannot live without this person or, you know, this uh, pang that we feel. Uh, so once we feel that we are empty, what happens is we say, okay, now I'm, I need to go earn, earn more money. I'm going to go do some actions and all of that stuff. So while we are doing those actions, we, as you know, I mean, it is happening today, right? Uh, capitalism. Uh, so we are seeing uh, greed driving so much destruction around us. Um, so th there is one way to look at it where, uh, you know, um, it's a karmic reaction in a way, or it might be karmic new actions that, that is going to come back to bite you later on, right? And then it goes on. Um, it forms a certain impressions on your um, subtle body, as they call it, um, which, um, as per Vedanta, I don't know, I don't have the proof about that, is it stays uh, uh, even after we die. And then the rebirths happen after that, uh, because you need to pay for that karma. Uh, and by the way, there is a slide coming up on that. And this author does much better justice than I do. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, by the way, the, that, that, that picture with the hand in the arm uh, or the hand, uh, the water in the hand, 
is basically uh, one of our uh, very uh, um, uh, revered saints, uh, uh, Ramakrishna Paramahansa, uh, who is also the teacher of uh, Swami Vivekananda, who came to this country uh, to talk about uh, Hinduism in a very um, mind-blowing way is all I can say. Um, uh, and so Ramakrishna Paramahansa, he was not a very uh, learned, like from worldly point of view, uh, he definitely didn't speak English. Uh, but his examples were pretty, uh, he was considered as uh, almost as close to Buddha. Um, so uh, one of the things he says is, hey, you know, sometimes when you look at the lake uh, or a pond, uh, you might see uh, that the water is murky or green or blue or whatever, right? And you would assume that that's the, that's the color of that water. But when you go closer and you put your hands in it and lift it up, the water has a different color. It's, 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 it's fundamental nature or whatever that is, and you mistook that. So what, he, what this is pointing to is the limitation of our senses. Our senses perceive something and we assume that that is the truth until we dig a bit more deeper. And that is also the concept of this atom or Atman. Uh, now, when he was talking, obviously uh, this was uh, uh, early, I think late 1800s or something. Um, I don't think, uh, maybe there was a theory, but he was not aware of all of the atoms and all of that stuff. Uh, but he was just making a case for common man as to how do, you, how do we misinterpret things uh, when we do uh, something like that, right? So he gives that example, which I think uh, is so beautiful. Um, so non-dualism is about reaching the moral of our life's story. <laughs> So th this is again my take of it, right? So here there are these theories and uh, things that are built um, about karma, rebirth and all of that stuff. But really what it boils down to is every day something is happening to us. And non-dualism, what it does is it gives us tools to reach to the essence of what is going on. How do you learn rather than uh, put the blame on somebody else? While there might be, some fault on the other side, but then what do you, what would you do, right? Um, they they give examples of uh, like uh, uh, a fire. Fire has the fundamental nature of uh, being hot. Um, a snake has the fundamental fundamental nature of uh, uh, being venomous. Uh, a lion has the fundamental nature of being uh, fierce, and you know it will it'll bite you, it'll kill you, uh, right? So how do you deal with that, right? So that, that so you will be coming across uh, human beings like this. So what do you do with that, right? Um, so wakeful dream and deep sleep. Um, these are the three states that they uh, talk about, and you know then they kind of. Uh, associate that with individual and cosmic. You know, we saw about that uh, last time where um, Brahman, when it's when it is its dream state, uh, that is where you know it is uh, uh, making this uh, uh, playful thing about the world. <laughs> we come out of that. Objects come out of that, and then and then it goes back to sleep. Now they they also say that um, you know just like how we wake up, wake up and we say, oh, that was a silly dream. You know, we know that dream was false. Um, one of the things that they want uh, us to uh, consider is that every day that we wake up our wakeful state, treat it as a new state. You know, people throw around this terminology about um, uh, be here and now. And here non-dualism gives us the tool um, as to how can you break, you know, yes, there is a continuity. Um, sorry, I can't see people raising their hands. So uh, Jason, you might wanna tell me. I have no idea how to yeah, say We have a, 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 a Remco and the Mita, you know, waiting. Oh, okay, so just, just give, me, give, me, give me a couple of seconds. Um, so um, they, they, they want us to think of the wakeful state as a fresh state every time and that way, the past is not influencing how I'm doing things today, influencing mostly in the bad way. You can obviously learn from whatever uh, you have done in the past and use it for how you wanna go about it in future. Um, it's, um, they also talk about, uh, I am a person, but I also have a layer of father. I have a layer of husband. I have a layer of son. Um, none of those, that is a reality. 
you know, those are roles and those roles are de dependent on some other person, you know, like my son makes me a father, my wife makes me a husband. Um, so, uh, and it, this is the same thing, you know, like going from uh, body and mind to the roles where, where they want us to think about their, um, the, the, the nature of how they come and go, uh, right? Um, so again, um, we have a certain character, right? Uh, Swabhav, uh, I mean, how we behave, how we react, uh, how we deal with people. That is the self, the lower self. Um, but there is also a Swarup, um, and that is the consciousness, right? So that is that capital self that we, that, uh, we want to um, get to. Um, there is this term called as Maya uh, that is used uh, quite heavily. Um, and Maya is the reason that uh, you know, the human condition exists. Uh, you know, the projection that we talked about uh, kind of uh, leads us to uh, make lots of mistakes. Um, and uh, one way to understand Maya uh, is, again, that thing that we talked about, the water, the color of the water. And as you put your hands in it, the water color changes in your arm uh, or in your hands, right? So our senses, you know, we already know our eyes can only see seven colors, right? There's a spectrum of colors that we can see. There are things that we cannot see. Same is the auditory, you know, same is the taste, you know, we can only taste certain things. So um, the point is that um, when we make decisions based on what we see, what our senses are telling us, senses are telling us part of the information. Now that is just uh, uh, some tangible stuff, right? But then there are things that we are making up in our mind about things that we kind of think we know. <laughs> so that is where one of the things that uh, it wants us to think about is here is Maya confusing you. So watch it, right? That's, that's, uh, that's the point, right? So we are, Maya is, there is Brahman and Maya is layering on top of it and you are misinterpreting that and uh, that is causing ignorance um, and causing a lots of things, right? Mind should never be, never ever be disturbed. One of the fundamental, you know, if, if there was ever a sin in Vedanta, um, uh, they, they, there's no such thing, right? In Hindu, in Veda, there is uh, sin and all of that stuff. But in the only sin in Vedanta is if anything ever disturbs your mind, <laughs> then there is some problem, right? So you, you want to stop it. You want, you want nothing in the world to disturb our mind. Um, so again, um, there is the science and then there is the spirituality, right? So science is the study of outward objects, physicality, you know, and that is great, right? So uh, we have, we, we talked about atom and all of that stuff, but spirituality uh, that non-dualism is trying to deal with it is not about, you know, we try to answer the question like, oh, was the universe born like this and it was formed like this and Hinduism talks about this and that. That's not the point. The point is me, right? The subject. So spirituality is the study of subject. And you know, that's, that's really what Vedanta is trying to drive and not uh, dwell too much on, uh, you know, Big Bang or any of that stuff. That is left to science, right? Uh, universe uh, from, uh, yeah, so they, there are, every religion has a certain uh, thing about it. Um, but really, if you were to drill down as to why a religion is trying to tell the story or building a myth around certain uh, creation stories, there is more to that story and it is trying to drive you towards yourself. And Hinduism does that, but it is lost on a lot of people. Um, and I'm sure every other religion does that. And what, what non-dualism or Vedanta tries to do is it gives us the tool to use religion, but then transcend and utilize it to come back to yourself, right? Um, uh, uh, one more key concept is space and time exists when body exists. Uh, so what, what that means is, uh, you know, like I exist, my consciousness gives birth to world, and this notion of time. And then what comes out of it is I versus you. And sometimes there is this unknown that we call as God. Um, and then there is names and forms, right? So now suddenly what has happened is me, there are certain names that I know, language, and then there are forms out there. 
So my world ends where the language ends. You know, they, this was uh, some uh, famous uh, philosopher said that uh, in the West. Um, so that, that, is, that is the scope of uh, the universe, right? But what we are talking about in, with consciousness or Brahman, uh, it has these three really fundamental things, which is there is existence, means this cup exists. I exist, Jason exists, so, so, so all of you, right? And part of it exists because I know you exist, right? I is important. Consciousness is important for me to say Jason exists. If I'm not here, it doesn't matter if Jason exists or not. <laughs> um, so uh, chit, uh, awareness. So Jason exists, but my knowledge of Jason, my awareness gives me, uh, you know, it's different than, let's say, this, uh, this cup is looking at Jason. This cup doesn't have the awareness of Jason. So you cannot do anything with it. I can do something about it, right? I can do something about this lecture that I'm listening to. Uh, there is something going on. And what, what all of this results into is some kind of bliss, right? Uh, so so the, these are the three states. Ultimately, our human endeavor for anything that we do is happiness, as you know, right? Now, the happiness that we are always driving towards is pleasure, which is which stays and goes away, stays and goes away, right? Comes and goes away. And we are in that circle uh, constantly. But um, we are fundamentally looking for that infinite bliss, uh, which is what our consciousness is made of. And uh, that is the bliss that they are talking about. Anand Ananda also has another pronunciation, uh, not pronunciation, but there is another word which is very similar to this, ananta, with a T. Ananta means infinite. Ananda means bliss in this case, right? So, so which is interesting, I thought. Um, there's this one other thing. So a lot of our happiness is about objects out there, right? Vishaya is what they are called. Um, so, and, and these objects can be physical or mental. Um, they, um, you know, and, and what, what that, uh, they, they all boil down to these uh, five different uh, uh, things basically. Um, as per uh, some theory that I read. Uh, rasa. Rasa is desire, taste, interest. Um, and it ultimately boils down to um, a rasana is what they say, which has to do with our tongue. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But then there is the shabda. Shabda is the speech. Um, and uh, we have words for objects. And once we have the word, we have certain interpretation about it and our interpretation now suddenly limits what that object might potentially be. <laughs> um, sparsha, uh, touch, uh, roop is the form. Um, so a certain form will give us some pre-notions of what that might be. Uh, gandha is smell. Um, so one of the key things that I wanted to highlight about the rasa is the desire or the taste and uh, also interest, right? You know, those things can um, be quite um, a futile in a way uh, because you know you you might think that oh you know I'm doing something really interesting and I'm 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 getting getting all these accolades and all that stuff and I'm getting so much joy as I'm playing the guitar and piano or whatever, right? All of that stuff, or I I, I want to eat certain kinds of food, right? Uh, all of that. Uh, so. But that is, again, that pleasure that is not going to stay with you for a long time. And then there is also another aspect about this is your desire to respond. Like you want to respond to something, uh, react, uh, and that, that can also be a problem. Let me see where I am with this. Uh, oh, we talked about this karma where, you know, limited me, lackingness, and action to satisfy oneself. And, you know, that leads to success, failure, and... Uh, you know, we, it usually leads to, if you're successful, then you become more greedy. Uh, but if you fail, you become angry, and then you are continuously in that cycle, and you could be hurting other people, again, building the karma uh, that is going to uh, bring you back to this life, right? I think we're part of a greater wisdom than we will ever understand, a higher order. Call it what you want. You know what I call it? The big electron. Big electron. Whoa. Doesn't punish, 
It doesn't reward. It doesn't even judge. It just is. And so are we for a little while. So that, that was interesting. Uh, anyways, uh, so let's go to questions. Uh, yeah, the, uh, Remco and uh, Mitra have hands up for a long time. So. Okay, go ahead. All right. Yeah, thanks, JKB. My, I put my hand up um, some 10 minutes ago, so I, I want to re refer back to an earlier slide. Um, but my first thought is this, uh, and it relates to the comment on that slide. Um, I think, and I have always have my mind on the quantum uh, physicists, because many of them, and I think I mentioned that in your uh, previous talk, many of them uh, looked to the East, they were exploring um, some of the wisdoms, and, and, and they, they developed some uh, confidence in, in what they were experiencing um, firsthand. Um, and that's great. But, but leading on to that, does the East look at what the West, let's, let's see it as a divide and not a necessarily a good divide, you know, a healthy divide, but we have a divide. And my question is this, does the East, uh, what you've been presenting, also observe, you know, reflect on what the West is doing? So in particular, uh, in that slide where you talk about the Atman, the Anatma and the Paraatma, there is a word that you used and you used it three times, and that is projection. You used the word projection several times. And I wonder, I wonder whether that word, and it's a question, and that's my question. I wonder whether the word projection needs to be looked at. Is it really projection or is it observing? Because there is ob obviously a, a big difference. And also at the back of my mind, <clears throat> And, and we can dismiss this uh, comfortably, if you like, um, is the allegory of the cave. You know, the projection of, of Plato um, talking about the, the fire and the prisoners of the cave and seeing the shadows and confusing that for reality. So my word really is, sorry, it's a bit long and, and protracted, but my question is really, is the word projection appropriate? Because it, 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 it suggests to me some form of having some agency in the experience of the world um can whereas I, can observing I, I, I gives you a more that? passive and that's where I, I i will stop okay okay yes because if you're going on i i would like to break into segments and then that way i don't forget what you said because uh, you're you're making some really keen observations um so projection i do not mean it as observation in fact uh, what we want to convert them into is um very clinical observations of life. You know, what happens is projection basically means is unfortunately, um, whatever we see, you know, first of all, we have consciousness. Consciousness by itself cannot do anything. It needs the body. So it needs the mind and the senses and the objects, right? So it needs all of that mechanism, the instrument to interpret the world and reach the knowledge and the bliss, right? So now what happens is most of the time is uh, because the senses is, are telling you certain reality um, that is out there and you assume that that is the reality. Um, and most time that might be the case, uh, but many a times you forget that, you know, your senses are limited in what they can capture. Uh, so what happens is the, I'm, I'm just talking about the physical senses, but then there is the mental uh, thought process, right? So those thoughts are also considered as objects, by the way, in Vedanta. Uh, so those thoughts come and go about a certain person, certain things in politics or a certain war that is going on that you are not physically there. Uh, so what you're doing is your life experiences are taking that, that physical experiences, that physical reality, or that thing that is coming through the senses to your eyes, and you're projecting a certain reality that might not be the case. And that is in fact Maya, right? So what there is a certain observation capability that we have, if we stick with that, life would be happier. But what happens is mind comes in the middle and it says, look, what you're seeing that, remember last year, that's what happened. Boy, those guys are horrible or something like that, you know? And so there, there is that projection that is where Vedanta is wanting us to kind of, how can we curb down mind, right? So I have, I have certain slides. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get to that. It might be third or fourth lecture, Jason. Uh, so uh, 
but yeah, that's in nutshell uh, what I would say. Uh, maybe we go to the next person, Metra. Yeah, I, I think I also raised the hand around that time on this slide. Uh -huh. um, so uh, it's interesting that you're trying to cover a whole lot of things, which each of which is going to take hours. Um, so, or days maybe. So uh, it's it kind of difficult to understand, but at the same time, I found it interesting that you are, for the first time I'm seeing these concepts are being uh, explained in a reductionist point of view, like atom. And uh, while Brahman, the word Brahman comes from brew, from the root brew, which vastness, means yeah. expand, which means expanding and vastness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's interesting. I, I mean, uh, even the Panchakosha that you show, the physical is in the outer layer, while in Taitariya Upanishad, it is the, uh, I, I have a slide on that. It, it uh, will basically turn upside down. Yes. yes. So yes. it should be. So, no, but, I, but again, I think, I think one thing you have to understand is we all come from different backgrounds here. Uh, I, every so often I will get somebody who is uh, from India and uh, um, there is a certain understanding. So I have to kind of make sure that I'm bringing people along with me. Uh, so I don't want to go into a deep dive philosophical um, uh, place. Uh, I would rather have everybody experience the concepts, at least superficially, because ultimately, if it triggers, if any of this triggers, you don't need me, right? You can just go on your own and explore this. And, and this whole idea of uh, physicality, uh, sorry, the, the koshas and how it is explained in so my, my approach to this is not, uh, what is the word, uh, purity, <laughs> if that's no, the- let, that's, let's, not, uh, let's not dwell on that. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to point out that we, we uh, it looks like we are getting into a reductionist point of view, which Vedanta and Upanishad try to, uh, they just have the opposite uh, view. Again, but, I, 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 the big disclaimer I have here is I'm ignorant. And I am, I am interpreting this the way I see fit. I agree. And yes. also I am utilizing this for my life's experiences. And it has certainly uh, helped me understand human beings in a much better way, I would say. Uh, I mean, but no, no. I again, understand, I understand people completely. can explore on their own. I understand completely. And I found it actually interesting because uh, I have never mm -hmm. thought of in that way. So it, it's actually an interesting way of uh, explaining. Uh, and, yeah, and that, 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 yeah, that, that is why, you know, you look at, you look at all these little books, right? See or seen, there's only whatever number of uh, things. There are books written on that, right? Drik Drisha yeah. Viveka. There's yeah. books written. People have written interpretations upon interpretations upon interpretations. That's the beauty of this. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me just complete, uh, because there are quite a few points that uh, during the discussion that I had. Um, the other thing I think James James was asking was about uh, you know karma, and uh, since uh, he seemed a little uncomfortable and a slightly I don't know what the word he used but it was like a little negative connotation on wh why this karma thing uh, or some negative connotation. I, Self fulfilling I, prophecy. Sorry, yeah. Self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Uh, Self-fulfilling, okay. So uh, just a word about that is in any religion, you take Christianity, Muslim, uh, Islam, or Hinduism, any religion, you do have an um, eschatology, right? What happens after death, right? And in Christianity, uh, in all the Abrahamic religions, the eschatology, is that after the death, uh, I mean, I don't know much about it, but what I understand is that after the death, the soul waits for judgment, right? For the judgment day. And then either it goes to heaven or it goes to hell. But no one denies, none of the religions deny that there is something that happens after death. It is not, except science, which will tell you that the body simply decays and uh, disappears and nothing happens. More, all religions say 
that something happens, something happens to the soul or something happens there. What Hinduism says here is that no, it's not, I mean, it's a di different take that not just going permanently to here or there, but it reappears in different form, different body, and again goes through until it finally gets liberated um, because of its own, uh, you know, purity. So there is no, not much difference between uh, the, all these religions because everyone accepts something happens after that. Okay. okay. So James. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll just get my, just my point in right away on Un Atman uh, for, uh, for uh, Remco's question. Uh, the, the way, I think the best way to look at it is that projection is a two-way dance between belief and reality. So this is actually uh, belief, belief isn't just something that's outward and reality isn't just something that happens to us. It's a two-way dance. So that's, that's the way I look at that concept. Okay, so Elena. Um, yes, hello, and uh, I'm joining the discussion at this point. So let me just ask this question. So I'm looking at the, uh, at the, um, the graph and uh, what it says that there is Atman, which is consciousness. Everything is a projection of mind. Mm -hmm. um, then we have um, uh, opposite to it, Anatma, body, mind, uh, believing that projection is reality. So say illusion, the world of illusion, but which we live in, uh, the physical one. And then uh, Param, Atma, ultimate, Mm -hmm. um, consciousness, everything is a projection of Brahman. So um, what is the, if when out of the illusion, body, mind, we go into Atman, projection of mind, how is it different pro uh, from projection of Brahman? Is it also like another, uh, say, level of uh, illusion? Um, and then we go into projection of Brahman, which is ultimate reality, ult oh, no, ultimate consciousness and the self itself would you please uh, just uh, yeah so again uh if you can hold your uh, question uh, for a little bit uh because I, I i'm going to cover some more concepts and uh, things will be a little bit uh, more clearer these were just some interesting uh ideas that i wanted to quickly throw here um so can we just get back to the slide set and i will come back to you definitely elena okay um uh, so let me uh, let me continue here. Um, okay, so we we kind of covered all of this stuff. So um, uh, do you guys want me to review this or just go to the next uh, next part, the second part? Um, um, okay, so. Um, I mean, uh, so the, the you can you can look at the article that I sent, and it has a certain uh, flow where it kind of wants you to. It, it is it is presented as a form of a prayer, um, but um, uh, th th there's also a really interesting thing about Vedanta where um, you know a prayer when you are putting uh, asking for God's blessings, uh, you are asking for certain things. Um, you know, th there is a way to ask for physical things. But here, the, the, the person is asking for something that is even more precious, that we don't know that that is precious. <laughs> that, hey, I want, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, right? So, um, so I, I, I hope I, I can live like this or something like that. So off of that, I kind of based, um, hey, look, when you're looking at non-dualism, these are the things that, uh, that will um, um, be uh, something that uh, you might want to look, look out for. Um, so uh, here quickly, uh, there is the wakeful dream. I, I think we, this comes a few times later on. So I think I'm gonna skip this. Um, so let's just... Uh, you, know, you guys probably remember some of this maybe. Uh, it doesn't get impacted by change. Um, so here, here is the thing that uh, Mitchell was talking about. So it is, uh, we think that consciousness is inside our mind or mind is inside our body, but it so happens that it would be the other way around. Um, uh, world is real, world is illusion. Those two concepts are uh, quite useful 
to deal with a uh, life situation, right? Um, so world is not me. I am definitely not Brahman. We desire and seek worldly objects and pleasures leading to more suffering, right? So if we think that world is real, um, we are far removed and shut off from the world. So because we think that this limited me is it, you know, my house is it, my family is it, everybody else is my enemy or, or somehow they're suspicious, you know. Um, but uh, when you look at this concept of world is illusion, um, so world is you, Brahman, and how does this help, right? So, um, so they, they, there are these two things where, you know, um, um, uh, so uh, there, there, uh, there is never a desire towards illusion, right? So when you look at an illusion, uh, so let's say you're watching a movie, uh, there is no desire for you to, you know that, that that thing is a fake story that is going on. Um, and so there is no desire. So the idea ultimately is how can we reduce the desires uh, towards illusory things or towards uh, here, everything in the world uh, is illusory, right? Um, also, um, when you uh, take the whole world as yourself, right? You know, you have expanded yourself when, uh, you know, uh, this might explain uh, the question earlier on um, uh, from Elena. Uh, so um, I look at myself and I say, okay, this is me and I have a consciousness. So the diagram that consciousness is allowing me to see, but what Vedanta is trying to say is that consciousness is unique everywhere, right? Uh, so uh, the fact that I can project, uh, I can uh, see, and that that object exists, and the, the way they want to phrase that is, it is the same consciousness that brings that object into existence, and your awareness is trying to interpret that object. So in effect, everything is consciousness, and everything is the same. Now, why is that useful, right? So when, you know, if you look at just your body, right, left hand, right hand, again, you know, uh, speaking of fractals, you know, they look at our own experience and they say, if you treated the world like this, you would not hurt the world and the hurts from the world will not hurt you as much, right? Um, so left hand, right hand is me. There's no desire for either. You don't say, oh, you know what? I like my right hand better than left hand. That never happens, right? It's just there, you know, uh, you feel like they are important, but there is not even like, oh, you'd never say, I love you, my hand. Um, so that doesn't happen, right? So the idea here is that you want to expand your me, expand your me to include the larger space. And that is where the concept of this Atman, Paramatman, and also Brahman, right? It will give you some tools. Now, do we know that for sure? No, <laughs> uh, I don't know for sure, right? The idea is that it is a theory, almost just kind of like you know the the string, uh, the string theory, right? For to explain the smallest object of the universe, nobody has seen that, right? So, um, but we have to come up with something that is an unknown. We come up with that. Will we be ever be able to measure that? Potentially not, because our instruments will be in a certain dimension that we will never be able to explore. Um, so what was that book, uh, Jason? I forgot about that book, the, the, the dimension related book, the British author. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 from the Aaron, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me show you the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, but they, there what happens is there, are, there, is, a, there is a world of uh, two dimensional characters. Uh, fl flatland. Flatland. flatland, flatland, yes, flatland. That's That's a good a book. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful book written in 1800s. This guy, I don't know if he studied Eastern philosophy or not. He's a British- uh, Oh, he's British. a high school teacher. He's a high school teacher, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, he wrote this amazingly beautiful book and it, it captures the essence of uh, Vedanta, in my opinion. Um, so um, there are two dimensional people and those two dimensional people um, only understand two dimensional logic, right? they will look down upon a single dimensional character <laughs> because there is, there is a line and now they are squares and rectangles. But one day this circle comes and it moves up and down and the square, the main hero of the book says, hey, how are you changing your shape? Because we can't change our shape. So he says, the sphere says, hey, look, I'm sphere. And uh, the guy says, what is a, what is a sphere? Because that word doesn't exist in my vocabulary. 
or in my universe, right? So we only know about things that we have words for. Um, that's the point. And uh, it takes a while for the square. He first thinks that that is some kind of magic and he thinks that that is wrong, that, that is some voodoo thing or whatever, right? Uh, he thinks everything is false. So they, it takes him some time to understand that they live in this two-dimensional world, world that is this three-dimensional thing and the sphere is part of that three-dimensional uh, thing. So um, the, same, the same thing can be applied here uh, where Brahman consciousness that they are uh, theorizing, Vedanta is theorizing, um, I, look at, I look at it as a tool for us to live our lives happily. Um, but um, if you are going to go scientific about it and try to explain that through some instruments that we have, we will probably never be able to. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the concept that world is you uh, helps us to uh, love each other, <laughs> uh, just like we love our hands, right? Uh, that's the point. Um, um, if, and, and the idea is that, uh, you know, again, no desire. So if there is any desire left, then we are, so the, the, the measure of self-realization is if there is any desire left, then we are far away from the truth. Um, so let me just go past this a little faster. Okay, so I think I was here somewhere, I believe. This is the last slide, I think, yeah. Um, so the idea was to reduce the impressions on mind and, uh, um, and we want to move towards subtler aspects. So what does that mean? Um, okay, so, you know, so there are objects and the eyes. I, I is subtler than the objects. Objects are grosser, you know, multiple objects, multiple forms. I is one thing that can observe any kind of object. So, and then you can keep going back, right? So mind and then consciousness. So what they are saying is you want to dig deeper whenever you see something happening, right? Um, uh, and so, so there is uh, things that manifest in front of you. So what is manifesting really, right? You know, that's the key question that you want to, uh, want to look at. Uh, so um, uh, every thought has two aspects, right? Both are uh, knowledge. This is an object. Um, so um, uh, mind, when there, there is a sense of otherness. So, you know, here, the first time you look at an object and you say, this is an object. So it's an, um, so it is something that is different from me. Uh, there is a sense of otherness, right? Um, and there is another way to look at this. I know this is an object, right? So now the stress is on I, knowing. Um, now suddenly you have gone from uh, this otherness type of a thing and focusing more on me knowing that there is an object there, right? I know that it's kind of subtle, but um, it's sort of a, a distinction that they try to make. Um, so when, when you are depending on the object to, uh, to deal with uh, interpretation or experience, uh, you're dealing with it using your mind. But when this otherness doesn't exist um, and you say, hey, I know that this is an object, you're sort of being this third party person or a, um, a witness uh, to that experience, right? So there is no otherness and that is uh, really fundamental to non-dualism. Um, object less awareness will reduce the impressions on mind. So um, I know is the key as against the name and the form of that object, right? So now suddenly you're not going to carry uh, some impressions about that object. So object can be anything, right? Object can be good, bad, dirty thing, or really fancy thing, or uh, something that uh, wants you to attract towards it, or it could be a thought, you know, like, oh my God, you know, they, this guy said that, and that guy said that. So your reaction is, you know, this is just awful, uh, you know, so anger, right? Now you could change that and say, I know that this particular thought is causing my mind uh, to get upset, right? So now suddenly you are observing mind as a different thing. So you develop this separation and uh, uh, that will help you to not carry it uh, through uh, your rest of your life, you know, that particular thing. Um, so um, 
the dwelling on past, uh, right? So that is really um, one of the biggest uh, feeder for mind. Uh, so mind loves that. Uh, and that can also uh, be quite um, uh, hurtful. Um, larger, larger the ego, larger the hurt. Uh, so this is where, um, you know, uh, there is the, the, the concept of God state, right? So God state, there is no ego per se, but God is also larger than me. So I feel like I have an ego. I'm better than this XYZ person. Uh, so the idea of praying to God is praying to somebody larger than me um, and uh, uh, considering yourself uh, uh, lesser. Um, so kind of uh, 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 humility effectively, right? Um, and, and, but, but really that God state or God state is my own state. You know, my own state when there is no ego, I am in that blissful state, you know, that that's uh, something that, uh, that comes later in the slides as well. Um, so one of the ways to deal with the impressions on mind is uh, uh, don't give the ego anything to talk about. <laughs> um, so uh, the, again, later part, mind will say, hey, you know, past, future, or two objects, oh, look, that object is brighter than the other object. So there is this duality, right? Mind loves that and ego thrives on that, right? Um, and uh, whenever you bring the mind to concentrate on one single object for a really long time, which is what uh, yoga wants you to do, concentration wants you to do, meditation wants you to do, mindfulness wants you to do, right? Every, all of these concepts are how to slow down the mind. And slowing down the mind, one of the key things uh, Vedanta observes is one object, right? Single object. So now suddenly that single object, uh, you know, really starves the mind and, uh, you know, it wants to then uh, get confused, but then you want to stick with it. And then eventually you want the mind to focus on mind. <laughs> so, um, so mind is focused on an object, thought, but then you say, look, mind, observe you thinking of that thought so suddenly when you do that now mind has really started dwelling in consciousness you know ultimately we want to dwell in consciousness most of the time what is happening is we are dwelling in our senses you know uh, one of the earliest lectures that we did was katopanishad katopanishad what happens there is uh, they talk about this chariot chariot you have these horses which are effectively the senses uh, the reins is the mind, uh, the driver is the intellect, and you're the passenger, and the whole body is the, uh, the whole chariot. Now, if the senses is driving your body, it is going to go haywire, right? So uh, you want your intellect to do the right thing. You want to tell your mind to shut up, basically, and uh, uh, control the senses. So the effectively, the control needs to go from the intellect all the way down, right? And that is when the chariot is going to be a happy place um, or our body is going to be a happy place. Um, our thoughts and mind will continue. And in this slide, I call, call this thing as whirlpool. And I'll explain that. Um, easy to lose into the world, right? Uh, so here, uh, when a particular thought drags you down, uh, that negative cycle will take you down into places that you probably don't want to be in. Um, uh, so this is where you want to pull yourself up and think about uh, higher aspects. That is what that subtler aspects mean. You know, like how can you get yourself away from the situation? Uh, just give me give me a couple more minutes. Um, so uh, yeah, so th this is a famous uh, slide that uh, you know uh, yoga uh, people might relate with. Um, so in the bottom three layers, you're dealing with worldly things. Um, so uh, when you have that situation, you are either getting uh, pulled into different whirlpools uh, or different uh, things that are hurting your mind and you are doing something about it. You know, you are uh, creating karma, you are uh, creating action, all kinds of stuff, right? So that, that is what is going on down there. And that only whirlpools lead to more whirlpools. You know, you get, keep getting dragged further down. Um, but you come to this anahat chakra or the heart chakra is what they call it. Here, what happens is you realize that there is some problem when I am going out and I am uh, getting angry and I am getting hurt by something and I am 
not getting what, you know, uh, the happiness that I'm seeking, you realize that, oh, you know, maybe the happiness is not outside there. There is where you start questioning about what is my accountability in all of this, right? Now you are becoming the seeker that they call in Vedanta. The first three states are, you are completely worldly. You have no idea uh, what, uh, uh, how much pain you are in. Um, but when you come to this place, the heart chakra, this is where that little kid in Katopanishad, he goes to, uh, his father says to him, like, go, you know, you're dead to me, you know, uh, effectively, that's what he says, you know, uh, because you insulted me in front of everybody, I want you to go to death, uh, basically. And he happily goes there. And he has this great conversation with the God of death. And, uh, and the kind of questions the God says, hey, don't ask me all of this stuff. How about I give you a ton of uh, uh, wealth and, uh, you know, multiple lives and all of this stuff. And he says, no, 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 no. Tell me the secret of happiness and tell me what death is. Tell me what happens after death. You know, like, uh, so, so they, they, this is an inquiry, uh, inquiring mind. And uh, now you're asking questions that are relevant to your self, your uh, well-being. Um, and then, you know, start, uh, you start uh, reducing the whirlpools that are impacting you where you're not pointing fingers outwards, but now you're protecting yourself from things that might be impacting you. You're, now you're becoming wiser to life situations and uh, the, the amount of whirlpools that might be impacting you will keep on uh, decreasing as you go up there, right? And um, the whirlpool filled uh, uh, river or whatever, uh, now suddenly looks like a serene uh, little landscape, right? And at each of these different stages, you know, there are different kinds of things that are recommended. You know, they talk about that in uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita and all of these things, uh, but uh, that's effectively uh, what this, and we will talk more about this if we have time. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I think Joe has hands up. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it can hold uh, up. I mean, because it was something in the Bhagavad Gita that we covered with this idea of the uh, the field and mm -hmm. the self and the knower of the field. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how that actually related to the slide that you were just on. Yeah. So yes, there is uh, there is the um, object, subject, and then there is you know person who is uh, learning from both of them, right? Uh, so yeah, that that theme is going to continue uh, all along. So uh, yeah, if you can hold your, I can hold up. Yeah, I can hold up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, so yeah, we yeah, Bhagavad Gita also talks about this, where uh, there is, um, uh, and and this uh, this book also talks about it. Is you know there 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 is not one way to go about this, right? So there is multiple ways to go about this. You like yoga, you like praying to God, or you like action. You know, like you want to go out and work. Uh, so in all of these things, there is a certain approach that they talk about, which is, hey, if you are one of those people who want to earn million dollars or, you know, make a lot of money work, and that is what gives you satisfaction, one of the things you could do is, uh, you know, humbleness, right? So even if you're the CEO of the company, you might want to uh, ask everybody or, you know, your attitude towards any problem would be, hey, how can I help you? be it even a janitor. So that, that will help you control your ego, watch your ego. And there's nothing wrong in making ton of money is what uh, Vedanta says, right? It's okay. <laughs> as long as you're not uh, hurting your mind and other people. Um, balance is the yoga or, or concentration is the, the divinity part of it, right? Where you are saying, hey, I'm going to curb my ego by praying to this God who think has, I think is the larger ego than me. Uh, and uh, that's how I make myself little and uh, come to a state where I realize none of this is like as important than this one action of praying to the God, right? So that is one other way. Uh, so again, there is also the, the concept of concentrating your mind to that one object. So God becomes the object and that is okay too, right? But the idea here is with any of these things, you're again going outwards. So you can do that for a while and then you will come to a place where you will get tired and you wanna move inside and you, you come to that anahat stage or the heart chakra. 
where you say, hey, look, there's more to this. Uh, you know, there's more to this worship that I'm doing to the God. Why do I need this little thing? Uh, I can have the God within me or something like that, right? Um, uh, the balance is the yoga part of it, right? So now you are suddenly, you're going from the outwardly things and you say, my body is important, right? So now I want to make sure that my body is safe and I am good and, uh, you know, I'm physically doing well and my physical well-being is going to control my mental well-being, right? Uh, that is how some people take yoga as, but yoga is larger than that, right? So yoga is basically saying, okay, the balance is really about your mental balance. Um, so, and then all of these things, you know, what Vedanta effectively talks, you know, if we ever get to the last slide of this presentation over a couple of lectures, <laughs> I'll give away the climax is basically it says it's all of this is effortless. You know, we think it, it is very hard. We have made this into this huge thing where it is unattainable, uh, but there are simple techniques that you can use where you can live happily and not make such a big deal about either neither yoga nor meditation or you know karma or any of this stuff. Um, so um, establish a deeper understanding of uh, Upanishads. You know this is one one of the key things that they talk about. Uh, spirituality, seek truth to the exclusion of everything. Uh, okay, so we, if we ever were to ask, what is your goal to a Vedantin? Uh, he would say seeking the truth, right? That is the answer. That is, what is the truth of me? What is me, right? So that is, that should be, Vedantins think that every human being's ultimate goal needs to be, who am I? Um, and non-Vedantic is, you know, uh, persistence, efforts, penance, you know, results into, uh, you know, that, that's what we are doing, you know, in the non-Vedantic style. Um, what that will lead to is always uh, emptiness, right? Um, you, will, you will get the happiness and then it'll go away. You will get the sorrow, but then you know what? That also goes away. And then you again get, get happy and all that, right? Uh, you eventually do get tired out of it, right? Um, uh, so Vedanta is, you know, you're saying truth is revealed. Uh, in that, so this is a key concept, right? So you do start with persistence and efforts. So you do start with penance. You do start with worship, all of that stuff, right? The Vedanta doesn't say that the religion is a bad idea, but it wants you to transcend past that. Um, so it truly thinks that once you're completely tired, you will want to do something more than that. You're as if you're on a ladder, you're standing on one step, and now you're lifting that step to go to the next one because you don't want to stay there. Um, and th that is uh, the way to your uh, self-truth. Um, so these are, the, these are the different stages of uh, how you're going to, uh, you know, Vedantins would go about it. Uh, there is a realization that life is suffering, which will lead you to inquiry. You will go talk to somebody. They will give you the instructions. You listen to it, right? you listen to it, then you will have doubts, but then you stay with it, right? So there will be a process of like insisting, forcing it on yourself. And then eventually you come to this final thing. And most of the time, it is not a gradable scale. It's not going to go from zero, 10, 20, 30, and reach 100. What they say is it is going to go from zero to 100. You won't even realize that. So you just have to stay with it and uh, you know you will uh, you will see that right. Um, um, I am you are that is the life suffering right. So it is it's always the other me right. So then that leads to uh, going talking to a guru or a teacher, and the teacher says that you are you know that thing that you think is outside is you, uh, and that is an instruction. Uh, so. Um, but then eventually you come to the realization that the, that I am, and that is where you, that is the journey from that you are to that I am, right? Uh, so just by believing the teacher is not enough, right? So that is not going to do anything. Um, so ultimately it means the same thing. The purport is the same, uh, but it is the, the idea of self-realization. Um, and truth is non-dual, right? There's, there's uh, that. Um, okay. so. That was one important slide. Uh, somebody had the hands up, I think. Yeah, Fred has hands up. So. Yeah. 
Uh, you had a slide, I think the previous slide about obstacles. Very helpful slides, by the way. Um, and there is a verse in the Padati, in the, the, the uh, <clears throat> In the, in the, in the, the in, verses, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and in, in the documents that were referred to, uh, the, the second verse mentions uh, the obstacles and they, they mention uh, laya, which is sort of a laziness mm -hmm. and, and, um, and uh, the mind losing steadiness and yeah. attachment and hate and so forth. Right. They also mention, which is I think curious, um, one of the obstacles is rasa, rasa's vada, and I'm trying to understand what that means because you would think that that the detachment that uh, takes you out of the suffering due to attack uh, to the attachment would be sort of the goal, mm -hmm. um, but the, it's into the rasa's vada. It refers to the effectively the disappearance of misery. Yeah, so let's let's see that, right? Attachment. So, yeah, pleasure is experienced by contact with external objects of the world. So um, uh, think of uh, a sweet that you are uh, taking, right? So the sweet is in your hands, the chocolate is in your, in your hands. So it is away from your tongue, but that is the object of your tongue's desire. So the only fulfillment you're going to achieve is when that sweet or the chocolate sits on the tongue. Once it gets to the tongue, now the subject and object have merged and that experience is the bliss, the pleasure, right? So the pleasure is experienced by contact with external objects of the world. Sometimes even in the absence of pleasure giving object, the very di disappearance of misery gives the impression of pleasure. Okay, so what that means is, um, so the fact that I ate the chocolate, I know that that gave me the pleasure, but the chocolate is gonna end. My tongue is gonna get back to its normal state and I'm gonna miss that chocolate. So I might go for another chocolate. I might keep going at it, right? Um, but I realized that, hey, you know, th this thing is not uh, doing me good, man. Uh, you know, I'm either becoming diabetic <laughs> and it is going to add to my sufferings. I'm gaining weight, all of that stuff, right? Um, but uh, if you, before eating that chocolate, if you realize that, hey, this pleasure that I'm going to get by doing this, there's going to be a downfall that is associated with it later on. And you say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to eat that chocolate. What has happened is that that valley that you're going to be reaching, you have not reached that valley, you that dip, and you get that. So there is that little bit of a pleasure that you've got because you did not do that. So sometimes even in the absence of pleasure giving object, the very disappearance of misery, right? So that misery is that valley that you get after you ate the chocolate. So the very disappearance of misery gives the impression of pleasure. So you, you realize that, oh boy, you know, I did not suffer. That's a good thing, you know? So every desire that you have, you know, uh, be it with uh, like, uh, pick anything, you know, anything that gives you ephemeral pleasure, like just for a short time, there is going to be a rise and a, a, a down, right? There, there's going to be highs and lows. And that low is where you don't go into that low. So it is kind of like a positive effect, if that makes sense. Um, one who has been carrying a very heavy burden on his head says he has attained pleasure once he has taken the load off his head. Uh, so I, I, I think, did you get the rough idea of what, what they're talking about? The Rasaswada is the taste that we get uh, and the the happiness that you gain because you tasted that. But then there is also a sorrow that follows after that. Um, so I think I, I had that in this slide, the earlier slide where, uh, you know, likes and dislikes, mind seeks pleasure uh, or fears from pain and both lead to suffering. So that is effectively the Rasaswana. So, so it seems like the detachment itself is not enough. There, to reach a Brahmananda, you have to go further than, than that. Uh, well, it is, it is sort of detachment, right? You are, you are also controlling your senses. So you are saying, hey, look, you know, senses is driving me towards that chocolate. 
but um, I know mind, wait. <laughs> don't don't take that chocolate. You remember, you know, you got this, 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 right? So you're learning from your experience. Uh, and uh, yeah. Thank you. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think you have to sit with this. I think that 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 particular verse is pretty uh, good, actually. Yeah. Um, so, did James want to speak? This uh, well, this just reminds me of uh, my son. He, when he was four years old, um, he uh, he had a cookie that he had never uh, tasted before. It was one of those really good cookies, uh, and uh, the uh, he uh, he just sort of like ate it very, very slowly. Like it was pretty obvious that my four-year-old was meditating, yes. meditating, <laughs> just absolutely wait, just being with the taste Ready of the bite, the first or second bite of the cookie, yeah. just living in that experience and not wanting to exit from that one bite experience, even though he had a whole cookie in his hand. A yep. very a large cookie. That's it. You got it. Yeah. So, uh, so how you how can you extend the the sense of pleasure? But really, even that, you know, you understand that our human drive is pleasure. Uh, ultimately, we are the source of bliss. Uh, so, anything that is going to give you pleasure, even for like one hour to five hours to twenty hours or a month or a year, that's not going to last for longer time. Uh, so that that is the place where we want to be. Uh, okay, so it is 520. Uh, let's keep moving here. Um, okay, so uh, let's just skip to the next uh, part of this. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, Again, I think th this uh, this picks up on uh, what we talked about here. Uh, you know, and we sort of covered this, right? So we strive to exist, we strive to be aware, and we strive to enjoy. Um, body mind limits what we can achieve, uh, so we keep running after smaller joys. You know, this is, uh, you know, I was quoting here um, uh, uh, Gatsby. <laughs> it has a very poignant uh, last paragraph, uh, which uh, captures this so well, uh, and the state of uh, Gatsby himself. Um, oh, did uh, um, so did you all have a hands up? Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm all, oh, yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. Uh, I just had it. This is uh, maybe you're going to explain this, but the, the bliss like you're making a difference between temporal bliss mm -hmm. and then this sort of Satchitananda, Ananda bliss, which is infinite, yeah, to me, a little bit of a higher. Type infinite, of bliss. infinite bliss yeah yeah right so are you constantly in this state in this sort of bliss is it how is it different than the affective state of like you were saying the contact between our senses mm -hmm. and the sense object yeah so uh, I, yeah there is there is going to be a section that comes uh, talks about that uh but okay. just to answer this to you is um you know, uh, the, uh, bliss is sort of like a, a state where uh, it's it's a little bit different uh, than uh, the chocolate and tongue experience. Um, but it is ultimately, that is our goal, you know, where, you know, sometimes when we wake up in the morning, uh, you notice, uh, you know, you have slept through and um, obviously there's nothing that is impinging your mind. <laughs> you have those days sometimes, right? You wake up in the morning, and for no reason, you just feel so happy, you know? So there is that objectless feeling of happiness. So here with the tongue and the chocolate ex uh, example that we talked about, there was an object, there is that other thing. The bliss that we are talking about is completely objectless. So uh, that, is, that is really a short form explanation of that. Uh, and, and we do- Would there be contact though? Huh? Would there be contact? Will there be contact? Um, no, this is this is an internal individual experience. And and what and the idea is that you know we we get to um we we experience this every so often, right? And the, the example that is you know, sometimes when you wake up in the morning, you just feel amazingly clear, um, perfect, happy. And guess what? You have not eaten an ice cream or you've not eaten anything, nothing and uh, nothing weighs on your mind just for a few minutes. 
and then the world comes at you. It's like, oh man, I got to get ready. I have to drop my kid, blah, blah, blah. Um, all kinds of things uh, rushes at you. Uh, but uh, there are these moments that happen where there is no other. You know, when you talk about contact, there is another, right? Uh, so the, the very key thing about Vedanta is about me, about I. And how can I be myself and happy myself? Like I'm not depending on something else. Right, so that is the that is one of the foundation of uh, Vedanta. It seems a little tricky because if you say, "Oh, there was no other," then tell me what does it mean to say there is a collapse of the subject and the object if there is no contact? Yeah, and that is that is in fact the goal that they talk about is uh, whenever there is an experience, there is the subject and object. But you come to a point where you realize, you know, so when you have this duality, what happens is you are constantly wanting to repeat that experience. You know, it's like, oh, today I love this chocolate. A few hours pass away. Oh, boy, maybe I want to go get another chocolate. And oh, I just ran out of chocolate. So I have to go buy something. Oh, I'm going to need some money. OK, then I'm going to do some actions, right? Make some money, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so this is a silly example, but you kind of, I hope, get get the point is like, we these experiences where we depend on the other there is mind wants us to repeat them and uh, and that repetition can cause us uh, in fact not can will cause us uh, suffering and that is a fundamental belief in uh, uh, hinduism or vedanta is that you know th this is the suffering that in you know, the desire and the suffering that follows right after how can you tackle that Right. The, ta the way to tackle that is how can this subject object duality collapses, non duality. So you don't depend on chocolate for happiness. If you get it, great, savor it, but don't, ex don't attach with that experience and say, oh, I want it again. Because the next time you eat the chocolate, assume that that is a new experience. Right. So yeah. don't say, oh man, that, that chocolate that I ate seven days ago, man, I wish I had that. And you know you're probably not going to get that experience, which is going to lead for more suffering towards more suffering. Seems like you're saying that when there's a collapse between the subject and object, then you shouldn't think of it as contact. There's another sort of collapsing, but not a, not a type of contact. Oh 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 the okay okay. So the the contact the earlier contact that I talked about where you took the sweet and put it on your tongue. The two separate senses of contact. That's what I'm these, the, yes. But here, what we are talking about is you come to within yourself and that object is still away. There is no contact. You get to a point where, you know, we, we covered in a uh, uh, seer and scene discussion earlier on where we look at, there is a world within us and we say that I am Brahman. But then you also say world is Brahman. So guess what? Everything is me. And everything is just, you know, just I'm, I'm this wider self, right? So there is no need for me to desire for uh, more money or desire for that beautiful car. It, there's no need. If I get it, I get it. If I don't get it, big deal, right? Uh, so it's a different kind of a contact. You're absolutely right. That, that's the best way to put it. Sorry, I couldn't put it that way. But yeah, you did, you did a good job of putting it that way. So it is a contact with everything it's just not possessive contact. Like you, you're not like holding on to yourself, right? Can I just uh, can I just add on to what SK said? Uh, I think SK uh, talked about Ramakrishna um, a short while ago, and the uh, and the question that uh, Amol asked. Uh, so we uh, the way I think it's the the, the paradigms. There are two paradigms. One is where we are trying to solve our problems, worries, and all that uh, with the external world. And so we are trying to solve and we are not able to succeed. And the way the Vedanta is talking about is actually not solving the problem, but dis so you have problems, you're solving your problems with the external world. Here, you dissolve into the whole, like, a, like Ramakrishna said, like, a sugar doll, if you put salt, it, salt, salt is what salt you, doll salt. Or sugar doll, what yeah. doesn't matter. Uh, if you put it in water, in a tumbler of water, it dissolves and becomes 
the whole water. So mm -hmm. here we we dissolve our problems by dissolving ourselves. So there is no problem, no solution. It's one whole. And whereas in our real world, as we interact, we try to solve the problem and fight for it, and we suffer. Okay, so did you have any other point, Mitra? Or oh, that's it, right? Yeah, that's it. That was oh, okay. just well, uh, Thank you. That was a good question and discussion. Um, okay. Um, okay, so, so you come to a state where there is this unitary flow of existence, consciousness, bliss, um, constant oneness, repeated reflection. Um, and now the next verse says, you know, let this bliss uh, flow through, right? Uh, um, and uh, those whirlpools that I talked about, you know, uh, something that uh, you, you kind of anticipate that this is going to happen in your mind and you get ahead of it. You shut it down. Uh, you go, either go do physical activity or focus on that one thing and you find a mechanism to shut it down, right? Um, if there is mood swings that affect you, uh, never let that uh, swing you. Uh, one of the things that uh, they say is, I refuse to be miserable. <laughs> uh, so um, let the bliss uh, flow through because that is your fundamental state. Uh, don't be influenced by world, nor by the mind. Uh, when dealing with world, see things from consciousness perspective, right? Uh, don't look at the world from uh, the mind perspective because it is going to want you to uh, be biased about whatever you're seeing. Uh, when dealing with mind, so there are these two universes, right? Like I said, there's the external one, which is the world, internal one, where the thoughts and everything are coming, creeping into your mind, right? So when you're dealing with the world, you uh, see things from consciousness perspective, right? You, you say, hey, look, I'm eliminating um, all of you, actually, right? So my consciousness is sensing your awareness. So I'm, I'm feeling bliss. These lectures are uh, blissful. Right, so it it has to do with my consciousness, right, uh, or our consciousness, effectively. Um, that is dealing with external world, but dealing with internal world. When an angry thought comes, you know, fearful thought comes across, you wit you become a witness, right? That's that's what uh, it tries to say, um, and uh, you know, just our day to day um, uh, living, you know, um, try to stay indifferent. To problems. What that really means is not about, it's not about inaction. It's more about not letting it impact negatively on your mind, you know, no anger, no fear, but you know, if you can do something about it, you must, right? Um, so um, I'm eternal, pure, aware, liberated, real, and supreme bliss incarnate, one without second. So if you remember, uh, again, again, in seer and scene, uh, there was a meditation style that they talked about, right? Uh, the Samadhi, there was the Savikalpa means object-based meditation and one was object-less meditation. Uh, so in one of the steps there was you externally force yourself to think that you are more than this limited body that you think you are. So that will not be the natural uh, state because we are conditioned to think that this is me and that causes all kinds of issues. But then every time this comes across, you're interacting with the world, you want to remind yourself that you are this infinitude and, uh, and it will become your second nature eventually, right? No more separateness uh, with uh, other beings or even God, right? So the, the, this God should dissolve and should become your inner being. You know, it's not that the God is going to come and protect you. No, the, our uh, wisdom about our experience and all of that stuff is the God that is going to save us, right? Mind's experience requires objects, right? Mind, the anger and joy will requ require objects. Um, uh, we just talked about this. Bliss is objectless. Um, so, you know, CRC in meditation, we talked about that. Body identification drops. Thus, inside, outside is under understood as illusion. Um, um, so there is uh, the... Um, uh, now, again, yeah, consciousness is, is the substratum in the world for the world outside and world inside. Uh, Paramatma, uh, common substratum for every object, name, form, right? Uh, the one that we see outside. Um, uh, snake and rope is a way to say, like, you know, 
these names and forms basically uh, could morph the reality of what you perceive that object to be. Uh, so a rope might come, you know, you might see it as a snake and you would be fearful. Um, but all of, who is illuminating that, right? So you want to remind yourself, right? That's the consciousness. Uh, Jivatma is this, uh, my limited self, uh, illuminating subjective I experiences. Uh, you know, we are the ones who say, I like this, I don't like this, this is good, this is bad. Um, we are the knower of all three things. What are these three things? Three things are known, the object of knowledge, um, then there is the subject of the knowledge, right? But guess what? The knowledge itself, you know, you can be aware, look, I'm understanding this. And look, I am being happy that I understand this object. Or, you know, so, so there is three elements to this experience. And you are, you, which is the consciousness, is the one that is shining all three of them, right? So uh, that is really a key concept to understand. Um, um, not weaker as is misunderstood. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so here again, uh, the, um, uh, this one comes from the fact that uh, you know every time you wake up, you want to really have a different understanding of what that day is about, um, because uh, you know, uh, for example, one who narrates dreams is not the uh, the uh, so when you are dreaming and when you wake up and you say look I saw this dream uh, one of the things that they want you to think about is look when you were dreaming this wakeful state was not there right in your dream you're immersed in that reality and uh, you know you could be in completely different world that your mind made up uh, and all the characters within there are your mind made up. And it could be a nightmare, it could be an amazing dream. But then you can narrate that when you wake up. The fact that you can narrate that when you wake up, even though the waker was not in the dream state, is that there is this third person, you know, or fourth in this case, is the Turiya or the self or the consciousness that is observing all of this, all of these experiences that you're having in the objectified world, right? Um, so thus, I'm not the body. Uh, so, you know, so slowly what happens is they call that these knots dissolve. Um, so these are the knots that we have with the body experience, right? Uh, so they get dissolved and uh, these are no, in, you know, we, we feel no different from the world. Then doubts are dissolved and, you know, the effects of karma, you know, you don't feel something is limited in you and the effects of karma will also uh, kind of go away. Um, I as body belongings is not the unity, right? So that is not, so th this is again, continuing on the same uh, uh, field. Uh, so the knots uh, get dissolved, uh, has a similar uh, terminology in um, yoga, where they talk about chakra is broken, right? You know, so they say, uh, you know, I, I went through this chakra and that chakra and all of that. So like, you know, if, if there's some expert uh, here, on the phone, uh, on the, in the, on this meeting, uh, but they talk about these chakras breaking up or the wheels that break up as you become experts in yoga. But really, uh, from Vedanta's point of view, is that something about life's experience, the secret has been revealed. So this breaking has a Sanskrit term, bheda. Bheda also, you know, has two different meanings. One is breaking. And the other is also like, you know, you, you, a secret has been revealed to you. You know, that's what that uh, also means. Um, but as you're going through this, right, uh, you know, when these concepts come across, there, there are going to be doubts, you know, valid doubts to inquire into. Like these are going to be something that you want to sit with. And eventually you want to dispel them, right? And eventually, really, they will dissolve on their own because some most of these do not have a specific answer. And uh, uh, um, uh, things like, you know, you mentioned self, is self different from body? Is there, if different, is self responsible for karma actions, good or bad? Uh, if self is not the doer, 
is self different from consciousness like blah 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 right so there's like a series of them i'm i'm not going to go through all of them but these are the same doubts that you know we are kind of discussing uh, but the idea is that like i said you you get the instruction the instruction is told to you look you are an infinitude you're not this limited self now of course you have doubts about it and we all i do too so the idea is you marinate yourself in that right you know think about it meditate about it you know uh, read about it right so um and and then you know that that is eventually you realize that there is a benefit to thinking about the world in this terms and that is going to help with your life situations definitely but it has larger meaning to it and it it brings you an automatic certain kind of a peace and you realize that and that is very different from eating ice cream or chocolate or something right and slowly slowly these doubts will just kind of vanish on their own so you kind of start answering those questions for yourself um um i think james had the hands up oh yeah sure yeah okay uh yeah i have a doubt great um <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah, i was just wondering if this is kind of like a it sounds to me like a defensive psychology in other words yes. you're you're always on your you know you're yeah yeah so so uh it's so if it's a defensive psychology no no a lot a lot of people compare it to stoicism as well like stoic right but stoicism yeah. is positive and then that it always emphasizes the virtues and uh, you've said a lot of positive things like uh, that when you when you were talking about the uh you know the the relationship between atman and brahman the there's a, there's a lot of positive moments in the philosophy but at the same time there's uh if people are sort of trained to fear objects no no, um, no there's no fear here so that can include that that could include other humans so that's all the, the idea of a defensive a defensive no, psychology no 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 actually uh, sorry I, I i said yes to something that i didn't mean yeah. no no um the 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 two fundamental things that they talk about is anger and fear everything results into these two states we either run towards something and we run away from something so you want to realize what causes that and you want to be in a state where you let things happen and you don't let it impact you negatively or positively you still act like you know if there is fire that is happening in your house you want to protect yourself not out of state of fear if somebody has stole money from you you don't want to approach that in a state of anger you want to approach it with again cool cool calm mind and uh, that that's the that's uh, one of the things that they're talking about okay uh who else is there i think the mjo and the dlj It's oh, just yeah. I, I just had a little, just a little quick kind of quick question. Just um, in the text, uh, the, the one that was kind of assigned the Shri Brahma Vidya Shri Vada mm -hmm. right, right. Mm -hmm. I I one thing that seems like it's mm -hmm. they don't really give salient arguments, mm -hmm. and uh, it it seems like um, you know, I I don't know the history of this text that much, but. Uh, it, it seems like this is a practice, or maybe you want to call it a spiritual practice. Uh, yeah, so well, it seems, it seems a little bit different than, uh, you know, philosophy or well, even different than religion. So it, uh, I don't know. No, if should it is. It is. Text. So so, you know, you brought up the word stoicism, and and one part of stoicism, and I think Pierre Hadot makes this really clear, is that there is stoicism does recognize a sort of practice. you know towards a living a well lived life and so maybe we should in that same vein think about maybe this text not as a set of arguments of, as being philosophy but a point to a direction of practice so where's the proof ah you have to do the practice and then maybe things get revealed yeah yeah so yes it, it so happens that we are talking a lots of things under the banner of philosophy here um but uh, uh it this uh, this uh, uh this uh, particular set of verses kind of intrigue me uh yes you might look at it as uh, in some places he talks about uh practices and rituals but i didn't see them as rituals and there's no there's no god as such being mentioned anywhere there are some names of gods being thrown here and there but those gods if anything right the person who has written this uh vidyaranya um 
you know, he has written so many books on Vedanta and he's marvelous. You know, we, we took uh, one other book uh, prior to this, which is Seer and Seen, um, and uh, it is just mind blowing, right? So um, if anything, Vedanta does not want you to think of God in terms of uh, ritual practices, right? Uh, and this particular thing, what it is trying to say is, hey, you know, whatever that power is within me, I'm praying to that power within me that may I get this state, this non-dualism state. And what do I want in that? I want number one, I want number two, I want number three, right? Not want is a bad state, but I want to attain, right? You know, one of, one of the things that uh, one lecture, one teacher says, Swami says is, when you pray, you are setting the tone for your lifestyle. That's how you, if you take the prayer uh, to be, it will manifest in that direction uh, for you. And this whole thing is really uh, a series of blessings. What kind of blessings should I get God? You know, and the God is within me. That's, that's how this needs to be uh, understood. Uh, DLJ. Yeah, right. Thanks again for <clears throat> all your good work. So I'm seeing two bits. I'm seeing a, um, an is and an ought, or if then, if you'd prefer. Huh? Um, so non-dualism, non-dualism being the is, and then the way of living your life and coping with the world is the second part, right? Okay. So I, I'm not actually clear how they're connected, though, because I, I, I feel like, so you, you've got different schools of Vedanta, right? You've got the, you're talking about the, the one with the A at the beginning, right? Advaita, right? But you can have Advaita. You can have the one without the A, which which does cover dualism, yes, mm -hmm. or which includes that. And there's a third, which no, is no, kind no. of so Advaita, Advaita, both and neither, right? No. So hold exactly, on. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. My my point is, I think you can get to the same way of living your life, irrespective of whether it's dualist or non-dualist. Could you not? That's kind of my question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good point. So um, so the Advaita, Advaita means dualism. So there is uh, almost, uh, if you look at the arch of uh, religions in uh, Indian uh, 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 religion, right? The Hinduism, uh, really initially it was all about materialism. <laughs> uh, what I mean when I say initial, don't think of time, but uh, think of in terms of like a thought process, right? And that thought process eventually became about nature, you know, God in nature and then a God in variety of things. And then, you know, a lot of these philosophies, eventually what it came to is looking at self. So there, there is this uh, books of Vedas uh, and most of it will be about duality, du duality, where there is God outside and you're praying and you are doing all these rituals. Uh, and the idea is uh, you're doing this because you want happiness. And the idea is if you do a certain ritual, you're going to get something out of it. Um, and that is definitely duality. Now, what has happened, I would say, in majority of uh, India uh, to this day, um, majority of us uh, still follow that kind of practice. So you will see a lot of these uh, images and gods and all of that stuff. But um, what Vedanta back so many centuries ago, uh, thousands of years ago, uh, not thousands, but yeah, hundreds of years ago, um, they basically said that there is there's some problem, you know, you guys did not transcend. You are supposed to use this as a ladder and you're stuck on a step and that's it. So uh, non-duality is the second layer of that ladder, right? After you have come to this place where you are devotional towards a God, now you got to bring that God within yourself. So, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually seeing, I sit when I do it in Singapore, I saw the same with the, uh, my, my Buddhist friends, some were God within, God without, and, and Christianity is another the personal God, personal Jesus, Depeche Mode, versus um, the one you pray to externally, the externalized ego kind of internal or external version. So I think that's probably, seems like a pattern, doesn't it? It is, yeah. Thanks, most, yeah. most religions, basically, you want to, most religions, they are doing that job. It is just that we don't see it that way. Um, very few people will see it where, you know, it's like, oh, how can I come back? It, Muslim, do, Islam does that. Christianity does that. Jewish uh, religions do that. Uh, all Everybody tries to do that. Uh, Karen. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi. Um, thank you, SK, for your presentation. What What is the date of this document? I just that that's not my question, but I was just curious. Oh, date. Oh, is it hard? Date and time. I think oh, you might have said it. You, <laughs> like, should have, you should have waited for my slide that is coming up. Oh, okay. Down. Um, because date is something that we don't believe in. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Never, it's, never mind. It's a, it's a timeless, a it's a timeless, it's a timeless okay. document. No, yeah. no, but but I think I think to answer your Shame question, right? So there was a Shankara, you? Adi Shankaracharya. <laughs> Adi Shankaracharya was uh, the the biggest. Uh, you know, like he's the one who kind of resurrected Hinduism in a new light when Buddhism came before that, and Buddhism yeah. basically revolted against Hinduism. And then Adi Shankaracharya said, "Wait, wait, wait." give me a chance right and then he wrote the whole new philosophy now it was already there he just presented it in a nicer form uh and then comes all these other guys right vidyaranya came later on so i would say between 1300 and then later on in the 1600s and stuff like that right and okay. vidyaranya gives these other interpretations which i think he's a master of this craft he's amazing yeah okay because um i, I just want to uh counter i'm a little bit and say that Mm -hmm. Though I agree that this is mostly reads like a statement of religious principles or sort of like, here's the world uh, or a summary of scientific evidence, right? It seems like it's, I've made these observations that this, this is how the world is organized. These no, are no, that's not things. how the document, he I says, mean, that's, 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 that, yeah, that's how it reads, right? No, no, but there are, there are, are there are, can I, can I just, can I just finish? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Just someone coming completely from a different culture, right? It reads sure, like, sure. here, here is the world. This is how it's organized. I started cutting and pasting just glossary terms because it right. reads a bit like a glossary, like this is this, this is this. Um, but uh, th but there are, there are clearly philosophical arguments in it. Um, so I just like, like for on page 16 of the document, I'm not sure what it is of the PDF. There's a, an argument from dreaming, which I guess is an argument from analogy of some sort about, you know, this is how which, things work in a dream. Which so worse. 16 of the texts. Yeah. Worse, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 So, so it's an argument where you know, like, elephant? this is our, there's also on page 19 of the text, the gem and the wire. Yeah. which is an explore, exploration of the nature of change and how change works that, you know, could come right out of, you know, Heraclitus or something. And then there's an analysis of how doubt works on page nine. So I, I think that there is, I mean, there, there are philosoph really intriguing philosophical. There is, yeah, there is a book. That I would, there mm -hmm. is one of his books that I would highly recommend if you ever get a chance, which is called as Panchadashi. And uh, okay. if you can get an English translation of that, that is just like he here he is presenting i i'm able to just take only short things uh, that's why right. i took seer and seen and then this one is the next uh, level at some point maybe we can dissect panchadashi and look at that yeah um, okay but yeah so i guess my question is and that's why i asked about the date is that how how does this compare with the idealism of someone like bishop barkley do you i wouldn't know you wouldn't know. Okay. I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay. Because it, it seems like there's similar. Uh, Actually, if you, if you take that <laughs> as an action <laughs> item, Karen, and mm -hmm. you can research that a little bit and uh, present it next time we talk about Hinduism, I would love that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so can I, uh, can I jump in a little bit? Uh, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, the question, like uh, that is an interesting question on in terms of uh, chronology. Uh, of ideas. I think that's what Karen, you were trying to point out the chronology of ideas. Well, it seemed like it seemed very similar to the idealism of Barclay. So I was wondering if it was chronologically sort of similar in time to those ideas, okay. either Barclay, because Barclay, Barclay was affected. Was, uh, Barclay was uh, when? Uh, around uh, 30. Let me just be, be sure of his uh, uh, of his days. So I think he's 17. Yeah, earlier in the 18th century, yeah. Oh, this thing happened yeah, in 1600. 1600. So, so Vidyaranya is, uh, so Bakli was much later. Vidyaranya much later. Uh, actually uh, was on around 1350. Oh, 1300. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, not only that, uh, his ideas came from even 1000 or 2000 years ago, uh, texts from which were like two, 3000 years before him. Yajurveda and Samaveda and all of so, those Vedas, these are buried in there, you know, like somebody else wrote them and uh, uh, he's giving his interpretation. Yeah. So he was actually trying to explain in simpler terms 
mm-hmm. what was already written uh, written uh, thousands of years ago in fact he never says in any of his books he never says that this is my idea that is one of the key thing you know why uh, you know going back to like historical timeline or authorship uh, one of the things is like they don't say that you know i'm writing now they are attributed like some of these things you mm-hmm. know some of the books uh we don't know the authorship but what people have done is the historical archaeologists is there such a thing where they look at the pattern of style of writing and they say oh you know this kind of falls in the pattern of vidyaranya so he must have written this uh so yeah i'm all yeah i would i would assume if there's any influence it would be the uh india influencing barkley rather than the other way around but i but i was just curious it's kind of curious if similar ideas are in the air um in different parts of the world even if there is no connection right there oh, could yeah. be there could be influences or there could be independently uh, thought about exactly, exactly. Uh, but uh, but suddenly uh, the ideas of uh, of what vidyaranya uh, swami wrote uh, was actually a, a, a compendium and comprehensive uh, comprehensive kind of uh, compilation of ideas which were there much before him mm. he was not the originator yeah and lo- lot Thank of thing so much the- a lot of the people come to the same understanding right you know i was i was thinking of a uh, uh, little more uh, cultural uh, pop cultural icons like uh, george carlin the thing he talks about big electron man that is just like to me it was just like brahman and i bet 100 dollars i don't think he has probably even gone closer to hinduism um mm-hmm. or uh, bruce lee you know where he talks about the water and the flow of water and all of that stuff of course you know he has the influence of uh, china but there is a verse that comes in this uh, uh, in this thing where it has a very similar tone where you want to stay shapeless you know formless sort of thing mm-hmm. um yeah yeah i think the obvious options are the obvious options right like so if you think about consciousness and and body or or the or mind and matter there's the there's the view that there are two different things there's the view that one there's one and it's either mind or matter so there's three positions that are kind of obvious so yeah. um amol do you go by amol by the way or oh, no. oh, yeah you can call me amjol 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 sorry yeah amol is a very indian name too actually yeah. Uh, my name is uh, made up, so it's not. <laughs> oh, you just made up your name. Ah, I'm Joel. No, okay. No, no, I, I didn't make it. That my my parents made it up. Oh yes, see that that's a very important observation. Yeah. Yeah. We have no control over who we cannot pick our parents, and neither can we pick our names. Yeah. <laughs> and my last name is part of that world. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. I know. Yeah. Go ahead. One of this. Uh, I hope Karen. I hope you're having a productive summer. Um, but but Karen when you read a, a, a text like this it seems to me there will be uh, you know arguments you know analogies and stuff like this but no indian philosopher would take this as serious arguments because there's not a really structured sense of inferences being laid out the reason is because i don't think it was purposed for that so who are the audience for this text who would read this text who would say yes this is it's all ready for those who are on the path so there's no strong sense of convincing me to be a follower of advaita vedanta i'm already a follower it's just already showing you what's going to happen when you get into these sort of samadhi states what are the seven types of samadhi states what are the, what's going to happen what are the causes and the effects it seems to me that's so it's kind of revealing in that sense but it's not for strict arguments against other you know darshana schools out there i don't see that as this text at all and yeah and as far as comparing it with a western thinker advaita vedanta might be similar to maybe spinoza maybe closer to that because bishop barkley has god in the back he always has god doing his his background here even the gods are constituted of brahma so this is a monism not a monotheism that would be the difference i would think All right. Um anybody else? Thank, thank you Am Joel. That was brilliant. Yeah, uh, brilliant you. summary. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, thank you. So I, I think it's, thank you Am Joel to talk about this. So, so uh <clears throat> that's explain why according to Am Joel this text is not try to convince you right like all the western 
philosopher philosophy writing are try to convince you that's the idea. This one is not the one to convince you. That's why I make it difficult to understand. That that's just like my theory. Yeah. Mm. I well, find it. Mm -hmm. go yeah, go ahead, James. Uh, what what I find difficult is the idea in the text of uh, following a uh, following an instructor. The idea that uh, you won't really you won't know anything just thinking and uh, doing in the world. You'll have to uh, you'll have to uh, find you have to find a guru. You have to find someone who knows uh, the uh, the answers and then pose your questions. Uh, you know when you become experienced at uh, posing questions. So there's this idea that uh, you know there's definitely a way, but the way is through this. Um, I don't know if they call it a priesthood, but these guys obviously are professional. Uh, these are professional. I'm not. I'm not sure if if I'm. Well, actually, actually uh, that that yeah. no. They uh, there are there are multiple examples in the mythology where uh, this kind of uh, guru or teacher have come from different uh, parts of uh, different uh, uh, stratas of life. You know, they have they have been priests. They have been uh, you know cobblers. They have been. Uh, uh, butchers, uh, actually, uh, considering that you know we are vegetarian in in, in Hinduism, um, so there are some interesting stories about uh, the idea is that you know a person who has uh, reached or uh, would be capable of giving you instructions um, doesn't have to be priestly, um, doesn't have to be at all, um, and uh, that is up to you uh, to decide that, oh, you know, so this is somebody that I want to learn from, uh, and uh, you have seen something within the person, and, uh, uh, and there are certain instructions that are going to come, which are going to seem um, uh, sort of uh, outlandish and uh, unidirectional, uh, in the sense that, you know, you, they, they, the initial instruction is going to be, you know, uh, 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 shravana means you know let your ear pick that up and you want to stay with it and the doubts are going to arise and you want to meditate over those questions uh, interact with the teacher and teacher will guide you uh, towards uh, the right uh, right direction there there is another really interesting book that i i find uh, 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 quite enlightening um, uh, I'm forgetting the name right now, but where what happens is uh, there is this uh, uh, this character uh, who uh, by the name Parshuram, um, he is known for his archery. Like he's a really uh, big into uh, you know um, uh, basically bows and archer archers and all that stuff. And uh, he has killed a lot of uh, uh, the hunters basically, right? So he is, or, or kingly people, royal people, because he's against them. Uh, and he's a bit of a very angry person, blah, blah, blah. And he, he's walking through the forest and he goes to a hermit and he says, hey, you know, like, look, you know, you, you seem to be so happy. And, you know, I have won so many wars and, you know, I, I feel like the strongest person on this planet, but somehow I don't feel like I'm happy. Um, so what is the secret of your happiness? Because you don't seem like that as strong as me, but you know, you seem to be very blissful. Um, so he says, well, I'm not going to be able to tell you why, uh, but there is this other person who lives, you know, at this XYZ place, you might want to go and talk to that person. And so he goes, find that person. And uh, that person says, uh, aha, so uh, you're looking for this. Okay. Then, um, I'm going to give you a mantra and I'm going to have you worship this XYZ goddess. And uh, you go do this. You have to say this mantra uh, 152 times daily. <laughs> so he comes with this regimen for him. And uh, this guy, this poor guy goes and uh, puts this uh, goddess in front of him. And he does that every day. Years pass by, a decade goes by. And he's like, what the heck am I doing? So he comes back to this guy. It's like, wh why did you give me this goddess? You know, this, this rock, I, I have no freaking clue what I'm doing. What, what am I doing? What is, what is your guidance, guru, teacher, tell me. And he goes, you're at the right place now. You are 
exhausted and tired. And now I can, you are willing to come. This is that Anahat Chakra, right? This is that heart chakra where it is not about you wanting something from external object, but you are now truly, the, a true curiosity has developed. So a teacher can guide you through it as against an exploratory nature of like, okay, I'm going to read this and it could just be an entertainment. And as a side effect, if I get uh, happiness and this bliss that they're talking about, okay, great, that's bonus. But yeah, you know, this is entertainment. This is just like any other philosophy book that I'm reading, right? So that is another, that can potentially happen when you are going on your own path, when you don't have that external guidance. And in Indian Hinduism, they, there is a very strong need for this teacher that they talk, uh, talk about, yeah. So James, so James, uh, I think your question is very, your question is very natural. And um, given the amount of frauds and cheats, um, the gurus and swamis we have today, uh, it's even more, uh, more natural that someone like you and me would ask, what? Uh, you want me to uh, get attached to this guy who, who I don't know and all that. And, and, and we have seen how many frauds and scams have been committed by these gurus and swamis. Uh, so it is very natural in today's world. But, um, but if I really look at from a logical point of view, when did I learn anything about the world uh, view of my uh, worldview of my life? was when I was a child and I lived with my parents and my parents showed me by example, as I lived with them, the way of life, whatever that might be, good or bad. And it is, it is that to that extent that a guru, a real guru was not a fraud or a scam. Uh, uh, we would expect in the olden times, what we are talking about people who were actually writing this stuff uh, were real philosophers and not frauds, then if you lived with them, then you learn by experience because in Hinduism, it is knowledge is not uh, just a mental exercise, but actual experience. And uh, seeking, uh, asking questions through dialogues. In fact, the whole of uh, Upanishads and Vedantas are full of dialogues, not someone preaching, but actually asking questions and getting answers. So, so to that extent, I, I hope you'll understand why a guru is necessary there. And, you know, I think, uh, Mitra, it's not just the fraud exists now. Frauds have always existed. Uh, so Buddha is a perfect example of that, right? So he, even like genuine teachers, where there is a genuine school of thought, uh, he goes from one school of thought to another school of thought to another school of thought, right? So if you look, uh, you know, if you want to believe the, his history uh, or story, um, so it is also an evolution of learning curve, right? You know, you, you go transition from like, oh, okay, well, this is what it is, but I want to transcend to something else, or I want to understand this better. And then he takes the Hinduism principles and puts a new light on it, uh, right? Buddhism. Uh, so there also, he, he kind of, at, at different points of time, he does call out uh, these teachers, uh, says that, uh, you know, this is something wrong. I, I don't agree with this. Um, anyways, uh, well, thanks for your answers. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a 15 minutes over time. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I too, stopped too my presentation fun. a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need to get the SK some rest and, uh, probably one have, uh, MJ, MJ have the last question and then SK have, uh, closed the meeting today and we'll see you next time. And Joe, you have something to say? Or? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to get maybe your impression of the text. Um, it it seems maybe you can say something about this. If you can say it maybe quickly, since people may need to leave. Um, it seems to me that, uh, you know, this school, this particular school, emphasized quite a bit on, on uh, you know, it says in the beginning, you know, this really looking inwardly and looking at, you know, really kind of focusing on the, the metaphysics of what's going on inside and also you know a little bit on the metaphysics of, of karma and so you began your lecture by also emphasizing morality 
can you say a little bit more? Oh, uh, mo I, I said, um, yeah, morality. No, I did not. I, I said moral of the story. Moral of the story is what is the, what do, how do you learn from a life experience? I did not mention morality. Um, but um, going back to um, I to ask, you know, this, huh? do you think that uh, in order for these, a, a practitioner of this, you know, in order for them to be moral, really, they really need to understand the metaphysics that grounds the morality or the ethics. Do, do you think that, that no. that's correct? No, here, here the way, uh, if anything, right, uh, actually, this, this, this book is a little more advanced. There, there is another uh, earlier book uh, which uh, covers um, this in a much smaller fashion, which is the seer and scene. It takes through a very basic ideas very nicely. Um, so, uh, it, uh, um, so here it is. Oh, sorry, hey, can you repeat that, Amo, uh, Amjol? What did you say? Uh, oh, um, last part. Sorry, I kind of lost my own. Okay, no, no worries, no worries. It, it was just a little bit of a. Um, it seems to me when I was reading this text that uh, you know they they begin with with really this, the first thing they say is that, you know, this kind of strong emphasis on really the meaning of the whole purpose is to look within, kind of going in. Oh, oh yeah, I, I think, yeah. I think, sorry. I, I think what you were saying is, is the metaphysics important? Okay, yes. I think I, I got the like question. That grounds really. Okay, uh, so. A bit of your, of your, you know, not only because of karma, you know, especially agony and your, your property karma, not, not just only that, but there's something about, you know, the school that says, look, once you get this straight about understanding that that you are that, that is thou, then, you know, something's supposed to happen to you. There is a something happening to you. And that something it seems to me could be cashed out in really in ethical terms, but it's not clear right. exactly how am I supposed to be ethical once I see this non-duality. In, in other words, it's not just, oh, I have this bliss. Isn't there a way to be in the world after you come recognizing this collapse of the non-dual, this, this non-duality? In other yeah, words, you, Jiva Mukti, tell me about the Jiva Mukti. How is he moral in one sense? So, uh, uh, um, Joel, uh, uh, just one comment here. Uh, once you have realized, I mean, <laughs> if, if at all ever we get to that state of uh, realizing Brahman, that means that you are the self, the whole world is nothing but the consciousness of Tattomasi, as you said. Once you do that, I mean, I'm just hypothetically assuming that I am in that state. In that state, there is no other. And therefore, whatever morality, whatever ethics is for me, which is all. And therefore, it is everything is moral. Yeah, um, that's, that's a heavy metaphysics with other and someone else as one, but, but you know, explain what that means. Does that mean, oh, I should take care of the environment more? Does that mean, oh, I shouldn't be harmful to others? Hey, uh, mean, hey, yeah, I, I think, I think uh, yeah, guys- so, so now if you think that everything, everything is you, then how would you treat yourself? Hey, we are not gonna solve this in one yeah, minute. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Yes. okay. Uh, that's it, uh, uh, SK, the final words. I think let's that- just, Let's just wrap this up. I'm so sorry about this. Oh God. Um, so sorry about that. Yeah, some, um, yeah, some, this, some question is so big. We are not going to resolve. Yeah, we, I, I think, yeah, we can, we can continue later on. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I think uh, today what we covered was uh, the second part. Uh, there is more discussions that are coming about, uh, you know, uh, what, what does it mean for liberation? What is uh, mind? What, is, what are these karmas that uh, they talk about, right? Um, so, again, uh, this, uh, this can be viewed. Uh, as a prayer, it can be viewed as uh, attributes of what non-dualism is about, right? Uh, so, uh, so I'm taking it as the latter, uh, and a lot of the things that uh, might come across as uh, rituals and things like that, uh, those have an interpretation that uh, will be okay for somebody who doesn't believe in God and all of that stuff. So yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for an amazing uh, participation here today. Yeah. yeah, okay. Anyway, we have a Thank lot you, of SK. we yeah. cannot wrap up in one session or 20 section. We cannot finish. So okay, so just put in your back burner and uh, uh, a few weeks later say SK is come back to 
Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, James. I let you talk to next time. So. <laughs> All right, see you next time. I, I do close. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.